Hey, hi everyone, and welcome to church. A little bit different, hey? I thought we'd do it outside here with the beautiful uh, Hawaiian uh, frangipani type stuff going on there. So, um, uh, picked out some songs that we might sing together here today. I think they're poignant for the moment. Hopefully they minister to you and um, and uh, really thinking of you guys today, hey? Bl praying that God's blessings be upon you. So, a couple of songs that uh, I think we should uh, give a crack to. So. I'm going to start that up now, hey? Life is easy When you're up on that mountain you got peace of mind Like you never know
had won all I could win there was no place I hadn't been but my heart was so needy and so poor Then I heard him gently say Lose it all and find my way So I gave it up Found it all and more I lost it to find my everything I'd died a pauper to become a king and when I learned Find everything I was frantic To survive I was racing To arrive And I walked on In his standing in my way Then I watched my schemes all die And I realized that I could find new life because the old had died that day I lost it all to find my I learned how to lose I found out how to win Oh, I lost it all To find everything I lost it Oh, to find my everything, I died a pauper to become a king. I learn how to lose I have found out how to win Oh, I lost it all To find everything Oh, to find
find everything. terrible way to do church but anyway here we are we've got to do it this way for the moment I guess um, first of all I want to welcome back Deb wherever you are and um, yeah great to great to have you back in the land of Oz hey so uh, all healthy and well and wonderful to hear your testimony about uh, your brother-in-law your sister there finding Jesus that was worth it to go just for that also Nathan if you're out there um, and Amanda what wonderful news to have Amanda home you know, that's phenomenal. So if you're watching this, lots of love to the two of you. And uh, yeah, we're still keeping you in prayer, Amanda. So uh, God bless you. Bless you guys. Well, we've been uh, pondering a few things. And through the week, I don't just want to preach any message. I want to preach something that the Lord has stuck on my heart. And so, um, so we're going to go through something. I've got a few notes here, but really I just want to share some things in a very interesting time isn't it it's a it's an interesting time i mean from the statistical point of view it's complete rubbish i remember i looked at um in tuesday i think it was and they had the numbers there of 69 cases 69,000 cases worldwide the civil health authority said no no it's it's 10 times that amount so we're talking about 690,000 cases with at that stage i think it was 8,000 deaths which equates to less than one percent uh mortality rate if you look at the statistics 80 percent of the people that have died uh, over the age of 65 those that are younger many of them had health issues to start with so we're really in an insane little world so as far as fear is concerned if you're older and you're worried about it the chances of it actually happening to you is just about zero especially in rockhampton we've got six cases or five or six cases none of those have been transmitted from community to community they've all been fly-ins listen you are perfectly safe okay perfectly safe um we've just just finished if you like singing i lost it all and i can't help but uh, when i sing that song you may hear a crackling in my voice as i sung that because i think of dad every time i sing that uh with his testimony and uh, what we're going through is a crisis here. I truly believe that what's going on at the moment is a wake-up call for those churches out there. They're not being able to fellowship at the moment. There's a money crunch on with the tithes and their building projects and all that sort of stuff. What they've been focused on, God is trying to focus on the real thing. Okay, the real thing. And so, um, so we need to wake up. We need to wake up. And sometimes it takes... A crisis sometimes it takes uh, things to happen that are not good to redirect focus and attention where it needs to be and so I truly believe that this will pass and uh, but the lessons of today should not be lost don't let them slip from your mind when dad uh, dad was very successful uh, when we came from New Guinea he owned land, I think there was in Cairns, there was land in uh, Port Macquarie, he owned land as well, uh, Batemans Bay, uh, very, very successful. We landed in Australia, and, um, and as soon as we pretty much landed in Australia, found a house in Rockhampton, mum and dad split, and, uh, and from there the wealth just disappeared, as it does, as it does, um, uh, when that sort of thing happens, and so... If they could have held that together, they'd be very wealthy. But obviously, things didn't work out in that way. Uh, he got divorced. I lived with Dad for a while. And I remember uh, probably Dad for a couple of years there. And then I went down to visit Mum on one Christmas holidays or something. It came time to go back. And for whatever reason, I'm not sure how it all came about, but we, I ended up um, ringing Dad and saying, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay with Mum because Dad was shacking up with another um, lady at that time and the kids, there was a bit of friction between their kids and, and us and so, um, so I rang that. Later on in life, Dad did share with me, he said, listen, when you made that phone call, that was the lowest point in my life. I'd lost my marriage, I'd lost my wealth, 
now I'd lost my kids and uh, he was very, very low and in that desperation of loneliness, of everything that he'd fought for in life, that had disappeared. Now I had no idea, I was a kid, I had no idea what was going on with all that stuff, but God brought him low, low. But in the midst of the lowliness, some Christian reached out and said, would you like to come to a Bible study? A simple little Bible study that's in someone's home, Colin Shirley Macklin's home, old couple, mate, past the age of ministry, all this sort of stuff, have a Bible study. From those Bible studies, Dad became a Christian. And from that, the ministry that followed, the church in Mount Morgan, etc., the It's Time magazine, all that sort of stuff came out of that. And you're thinking, sometimes God uses a crisis. Sometimes he uses something that will bring you to a point of hopelessness, a, po a point of anxiety, a point of panic, a point of stress. Why? So that your attention from all the distractions of this world disappears and you're left with just one focus, what is really real. And you say these words in those moments, God, if you're real, and you finish the sentence. That's what he did. Out of catastrophe came a wonderful thing. I remember uh, a client of mine, he went out west and um, he was uh, in the Northern Territory somewhere and they had a, a, a boar, but he looked from the field a long way away and as he's looking, he saw what was looked like a man and pumping water. The man was incredibly consistent in the way that he was pumping water and just seemed to go at an even pace forever and ever. And he, he was thinking, that's amazing, how, go, how good is this guy? And then he gets out there as they got a bit closer, they realized that it wasn't a man at all, but it was a cardboard cutout of a man strapped to a pump. And the pump was not, the man was not pumping, or even the statue of the man was not pumping water, but was rather being pumped by the sub-artesian bore underneath. So there was no effort on the man's part. The actual pressure of the subartesian was moving it up and down and it made it look like that man was pumping. And the guy said to me, wouldn't that be wonderful if inside of us we had a, a, a pump like that that just kept going and going. Uh, but the thing is, we do have that John 7.37. If you've got your Bible, turn it to there, John 7.37. And it was the great feast there. This went on for seven days. And we go here, verse seven, uh, chapter 7 and verse 37. And it says these words, On the last day of that great feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Rivers of living water. Now understand this, at that time, Jesus has sat for six days watching person after person come, watching all the regalia of the feasts. And he sees them come with all the waters and stuff that's associated with that feast, and they go, and he sees them go exactly the same. And on the last day of the feast, all the rabbis would sit down. But when Jesus saw what was going on, he refused to sit down. He stands up in the midst of that thing and he cries those words out anyone thirsts come unto me and let him drink and he that believes on me as the scripture said out of his heart shall flow rivers of living water jesus sees the needs of those that are coming those that are coming out of ritual and going home day after day exactly the same so he stands out and cries that come unto me those that are thirsty for the living water and so he's going to do something about the situation and he's going to do something about your situation as well. I don't know what's happened this week, whether you've lost your job or, um, or you've been threatened with reduced hours or, uh, or maybe you're okay. There seems to be two speeds when I've been looking across my desk this week. I've had people in there crying and uh, having lost everything. Uh, or, and others that uh, it's just a magnificent time for them. The stock market's down, we need to borrow money, invest, and uh, happy about everything, it all seems to be the same. So there seems to be two people. I don't know if you're in that broken people out there, if you're in that, that lot, 
then I want to tell you God is getting your attention. God is getting your attention. He's standing up and he's saying, come unto me all those that thirst and I'll give you waters, living waters. God does something about our situation and he's going to do something about that. But there's three requirements when we look at that. It's thirst, those that thirst. As water is to your body, so is the Holy Spirit to your soul, okay? Uh, it's times of refreshing that come in to us. And if we're going to survive these times, we need to be walking in the Spirit is what needs to happen. And that's why I'm talking to you about these living waters. Because we have these living waters within us, we're going to have times of refreshing no matter what happens. Or we can go six days with man's rituals and the best religion they can come up with and everyone's going home thirsty still but on the seventh day if you come unto Jesus and you come unto him and you thirst then he'll allow you to drink of waters that you'll never thirst again and so C.S. Lewis said this I find it in my heart a longing that I that can't be satisfied by this world and it's not that this world is a fraud it must mean that I have a longing for another world in which righteousness dwells I love Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 13 that says my people have committed two errors two errors what are those two errors they've forsaken God number one and then they go on to a second error that says they start to hewn out cisterns which cannot hold water Jesus's water says you come unto me you drink if you're thirsty you can drink and I'll give you water that you'll never thirst again. Man's response is, no, I'm going to build my own cisterns. I'm going to forsake God. I'm going to go out on my own. And I'm going to forsake, I'm going to start building cisterns with water. The problem is that the cisterns that man, man builds cannot hold water. What is the responses? What are these cisterns? Well, it's religion, of course. That's what it is. It's religion. It's alcohol. People medicate. And people, one thing that has been going off is Uncle Dan, Dan Murphy. Mate, the people, they had to put a limit out, Dysart, David said, so uh, people could limit the amount of alcohol they're buying. They, if they're going to be locked up and stocked up and on lockdown, mate, they're buying cases. They were limited to the amount of cases. One bloke ordered 10 cases for himself. Alcohol, mate, this is how they deal with the situation. When the pressure comes on, they drink themselves into oblivion. Or they go into substance abuse, drug abuse, things along those lines. Those, that, that's what happens there. Or you might be addicted to prescription medications uh, or uh, it could be that you love movies and you're just going to drown out all the noise by watching movie after movie you know the 12th, 12th series of of home and away I don't know what you'd be watching but anyway the, people drown themselves in this stuff they medicate they have systems that that they can cope with life if they just have this thing okay the problem is it can't hold you okay so we've got uh, social media, so they spend all their time tweeting and, and all this sort of stuff, uh, messaging and Facebooking and Zooming and all this sort of stuff. Well, good on yous. The problem is it's empty. It's an empty system. It's not going to fill you. People are sitting there watching news after news report, coronavirus, all this sort of stuff going on, panic, fear, all this gear. Okay, you cannot hold water with that. Long term, it doesn't hold water, okay? Money, sex, fame. None of these things, power, even listen to this one, even success doesn't hold water with Jesus. The rich young man comes and he said Jesus' cure for him was, oh, you've done really well on all these other points. Go and sell all that you have and come and follow me. And he stumbles at that success can be the problem. And that's why God's rattling the tree. He's rattling the tree of success. And we're beginning to shake. Things are shaking. They are shaky. Maybe you've been shaken out this week. I don't know. But I know this, that those success is a, is a leaky system that can't hold water. Jesus says he'll give us uh, the water that can. In the end, all of these things, whether it's sex, whether it's money, whether it's fame, whether it's social media, whether it's alcohol, drug abuse, pornography, whatever it is, uh, success, they end up singing the same song. And it's the song of the Rolling Stones. I can't get no satisfaction, but I try, but I try, but I try, but I try, but I can't get no. And that's exactly what a leaky system is. They cannot find satisfaction to the left or to the right, okay? You, why was that? Because you were created for God. 
you were created for God and his good pleasure and unless you find him the emptiness and hollowness of this world and your life will never fail you'll go from one system to another seeking to be filled seeking to find fulfillment and finding nothing I've titled this message Great Gain and no I haven't I haven't uh, gone over to the dark side with the prosperity message or anything on those lines great gain because the Bible does talk of great gain and we're going to explain some of that the next thing though the next requirement is that he says come it says uh, come unto me if you thirst and you come it's he who believes shall be saved Hebrews 11:6 says this it says but without faith it's impossible to please him for he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You must believe that God will reward you for your faithfulness in serving him. If you stand for him in this world and suffer in this world, there's a reward. Even Jesus said this, that for the joy that was set before him, that's what he, why he endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. There was a prize that he was heading towards. So there's a reward for those that diligently seek him. And in this hour, we must seek him. What does it mean to believe? It means we trust him. It means we follow him, even when it doesn't make sense to our natural mind. Early on in my Christmas, uh, in my, Christmas in my Christian walk, uh, God gave me the scripture, uh, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And the second one was, and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge me and he will direct your paths. And that scripture has held me for many, many years. But the front end is trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understandings. We must be obedient to God in these hours. Okay, so we lean not on... Also, it means trust, but it does also mean submission. And that's where I'm saying we need to be obedient. It's okay to say, oh, I'm a Christian. But if you're living like the devil and partaking and not listening to his voice, not reading his word, not praying, you're not being obedient to the call by which you're going to receive living waters. You're still going to, you're going to say you're a Christian. You're going to go to church on Sunday. You're going to be panicked. You're going to be fearful. You're going to be anxious about what's ahead. But you're not going to have the living waters. You're not going to have the living waters. We need to have a place of submission unto God. If you're going to beat fear, if you're going to beat anxiety, then you've got to resist the devil. But first, you've got to submit unto God. And so that's what we need there. Believing in Jesus is not tacking Jesus on to your already busy life and, and hoping that that will make it an easier road in life for you. That's not what believing in Jesus is all about. No, no, no. It's more drastic than that. It's a transfer of trust, a uh, complete trust in him alone. Uh, picture a man who falls off a cliff and as he falls down the cliff, he grabs on to a stump in the way or a vine or something on the way down. He's got hold of the vine and just then an, an angel appears to him and the angel says to him, uh, do you believe uh, I can save you? And he says, uh, he looks at the angel and the angel's got all these big muscles. He says, Yes, I believe you can save me. And he says, uh, the angel says, and do you believe that I will save you? And the man's hanging, clinging desperately to this vine and he's looking at the angel and he sees his kind, compassionate face and he says, yes, I, I do believe that you will save me. And the angel says these words, let go of the vine. That's faith. That's faith. It's the letting go of of all the things that you trust in and trusting only in Jesus alone. No matter what life throws at us, that we trust in him alone. And so uh, that's, that's faith. That's faith. We need to let go of our grip on this world and experience the living water. The living water. The third requirement that he says here is drink. And that's an experience with the Holy Spirit. With him shall flow these rivers. Isaiah 22, uh, Isaiah 12, 2 says this, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord God is my strength and my song. He has also become my salvation. Here's another one in verse 12, Isaiah 12, verse 3. It says, Therefore with joy, with joy shall I draw water 
out of the wells of salvation. This water that Jesus is talking about, we will draw this water and as we draw it, this living water, it's going to give us joy to draw this thing as we draw it out of the wells of salvation. There are streams within us that are able to be drawn upon in times of peril that will sustain you and will sustain me. It gives us joy and the joy of the Lord is our strength. And therefore in this hour where there's panic and weakness and fear, no, if we draw on the living waters, we will have the strength of God, the joy of God in there. Isaiah 55 verse 1 says, Ho, everyone that thirsts, come you to the waters. And he that has no money, you've been laid off. <laughs> if you've got no money, come you, buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Nothing in this world can sustain you but Jesus, and these things cannot be bought with money. The very next verse says this, Why do you spend money for that which is, is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfies not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat you that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in riches. Jesus said if you thirst and you come to him, he'll give you rivers, plural, rivers of plural, that will give you power and strength in the deepest core of your being to face any crisis that comes your way, including this one, including that, this one. That is the ministry of the Holy Spirit within us in our lives. Jesus is not offering a formula. Jesus is not offering a recipe. Jesus comes to you and says, I'm offering a relationship. And these times we must get to know our God. That's what the pressure is on for, so that every other focus, just like Dad's testimony, while he had the land and he had the money, while he had the marriage, while he had all his kids around him, there was always things he could clean up. When all that got cleaned out, then his eyes went upward towards heaven. We must look beyond the loss of things in this world and look upwards to Jesus Christ. Okay, he said this, uh, you know, Walking, we need to walk in the spirit is where we need to be. I'm not talking about some uh, crackpot thing that we're doing. We need to walk in obedience to the spirit of God and the word of God is what we're doing. Okay, we're trying to be sensitive to the prompting of the spirit as he leads us through the direction of his word, not in contrary direction to it. And you may fall from time to time. You say, oh, look, I try on this and I keep falling out. Listen, Matthew, when he was one and a half years old, he used to get up on the furniture and then he'd fall over and make, he'd fall five times in two minutes. We didn't say to him, oh, my God, just give it up, mate, because you'll never, never be able to walk. Look at you. No, the very fact and the action of keeping to try to walk got into a stage where now he won't stop still. So he, he runs like that. So, um, so... Keep walking in the Spirit. It says, listen, Colossians 2, 6, As you have therefore received Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. This is the key to the times ahead. We must walk in Him. We do not walk by faith, we do not walk by sight, but we walk by faith. And therefore, we must see what cannot be seen, the invisible. We must trust in Him who has no eye has seen. Trust that God is able to take us through, okay? Uh, 1 Titus 6.3. Let's turn there, shall we? 1 Titus 6.3. I'll get there eventually. After Timothy. 2 Timothy. Titus. Here we go. Uh, oh, no, sorry. 1 Timothy 6 verse 3. Just a little bit back from that. Okay. It says this. If anyone otherwise and do... Uh, teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ to the doctrine which accords with godliness he is proud knowing nothing but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy strife reviling evil suspicions useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth who suppose listen to these words that godliness is means of gain from such withdraw yourself. There are Christians out there that believe that by, by being a Christian, it means that they'll prosper more, that they'll get gain in their lives. That is filthy motivation. And God says this to those people, withdraw yourself from them. 
okay that's what he says because these people have a doctrine that is so putrid it's to be outside the camp he says withdraw yourself from people that suppose they tell you to be a christian is going to be a bit more beneficial for you well i'd like to see them talk to our, our our brothers that are in pakistan or in saudi arabia or in yemen christians for whom uh, they get the lowest jobs and have to pay a dimmy so that they don't kill their families and they're they're of very low socioeconomic status and yet they're faithful to jesus and yet these Christians say, no, 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 if they truly came to Christ, if they only st understood the promises of God, you know, they'd be driving limousines and things along those lines. This is lunacy. This is lunacy. Okay, but he tells us how to get great gain. And that's the person title that I put on this. Great gain. Let's keep reading. He says this, verse 6, Now godliness with contentment is great gain gain the great gain that god wants you to get hold of is not money it's not things it's not job security it's not retirement funds the the great gain that god wants you to have is godliness with contently contentment and he says this if you live godly in this world you'll be persecuted for it they hated me they'll hate you is what jesus said and so but he says if you can endure that with contentment in every situation with contentment godliness with contentment he says this is did he say because we're well, going to start with nothing and you're going to end up with an empire because i'm going to be with you no god says the opposite he says these words he says for we uh, brought nothing into this world and it is certain that we can carry nothing out no man, I have, one of Jazz's uncles got buried with their Fender guitar. Well, I can guarantee you that six foot under, he's not playing too many tunes on it. So you can't take anything out to where you're going after this life. God says, if you can endure godliness with contentment through this age, realize you came in with nothing, you're going out with nothing. Therefore, whatever happens in the middle, we can endure it. We can endure it with contentment, okay? It says, goes on, it says this, Having food and clothing with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich have really understood the gospel. No, those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith. The Bible's teaching on money is be very, very careful. You can't love God, you can't love money together. You either love one and serve the other, or flip around and serve one and, and love the other, whatever you're going to do, but you can't do both, because it says here, that many have strayed from the faith if they love money, if they love money, okay? So it says they pierce themselves through with many sorrows. Are we sorrowing? I tell you what, it's been a hard week. I had to lay someone off this week and, um, and we're making adjustments on the fly as every announcement comes out and the future is uncertain, no doubt about that. No doubt about that the future is uncertain. We don't know what tomorrow brings, money, no money, we don't know. But we know this, that he holds tomorrow in his hand. And my future is certain in him. No matter what it looks like, it's certain in him. Because we don't love money, we love Jesus. And so we're not piercing it through with sorrows. If you're crying over money, stop it. Stop it. We should be crying over lost souls. What that is, when we, when we feel a tearing, when that sort of security goes, and I'm talking... We've all had this in times of high uncertainty when things are ripped from our grasp, things we thought should be certainties in life, and they go. When they go, please don't cry for them because Jesus said this, well, not Jesus, Timothy, Paul said to Timothy, you came in with nothing, you'll go out with nothing. And so this world is not our home. Don't get too attached from it. Look, let it go. And if it comes back, that's fantastic. And if it doesn't come back, will be godliness with contentment is great gain. Great gain. Not a little great gain. Not just a little blip. Oh, yeah, it's helping my emotional well-being. No, 
Godliness with contentment is great gain because you're going to see people around you so panicked and fearful that they can hardly cope with life, that they become nervous wrecks out of this whole process. And God says this to me, to you, God hasn't given you a spirit of fear, but of power and a love and a sound mind. And godliness with contentment is great, great gain. Okay. It says, goes on, it says, but you, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. You've got to ask yourself, was Jesus and his disciples full of wealth? Because we may go backwards, who knows? Well, there was one man who came in Matthew 8 to Jesus and he said, look, I'm here. I want to follow you, Jesus. I'm right up for it, mate. Whatever you ask me, I'm going to do that. And you know what Jesus replied to him? He said, foxes have holes, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He said to this man, great that you want to follow me. Are you prepared to be a homeless person for me? And that was the end of the man. God's saying we can take nothing with us when we leave. Don't get too concerned about stashing and stowing. Do what you can to improve your lot in life. No problem with that. But we don't do that. Also, I've read out in my personal devotions. I was reading in Acts chapter 3. And I loved what went on there because Peter and John went up to the temple at the hour of prayer, which told, tells you something. They were praying people for starters. And so they're going up the hour of prayer about the ninth hour. And a certain man who was lame from his mother's womb comes and he says, uh, they lay the and he asks arms, give me money, give me money. And what did they say? And Peter, fastening his eyes on him with John, said, look on us. Look at our lives, how they're different from you. We're not stressed about the money. He says, silver and gold I don't have. And silver and gold wouldn't have done this man any good. It doesn't change anything in his life. He says, but such as we have, we give you in the name of Jesus. That's living water. That's everlasting water that you never thirst again. You give him money, you give him arms. He's got it today. He needs some for tomorrow. But when they give him what they have, they don't have money. So the prosperity preacher's got a problem there because these were men of faith with miracles in operation. And they say, we don't have silver and gold. We've got nothing. Otherwise, they would have given him something. They've got nothing. But he says, such as I have, I give thee. And out of that living waters comes flowing power of God to raise that guy up and take him off there. Elijah, was he loaded? Well, he had his times in the palace. <laughs> yeah, but he ended up being a squatter with meals of pancakes every day, flour and oil. That was it, just enough for the day and being a squatter. Didn't even have his own place. He's squatting in with some widow and a, and a son. Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet. Jesus was a man acquainted with sorrows. These people were not, didn't get an easy ride in life. And therefore, when, we don't, when, when we're knocked out of our comfort zones, don't get alarmed. I did want to, my mind has been drifting back. Uh, every year I try and read the testimony of a man that I greatly, greatly admire. And I've done this for many years now, many years. And uh, the man's name is George Mueller. George Mueller. He's fam famous for the Bristol orphanages, uh, where at the end he had 10,000 orphans in uh, separate buildings there that he ran that. This was in the days where there was no provision for orphans. And so they used to be beggars on the streets and things along those lines. And this man ended up with 10,000. And a lot of preachers preach from him. And they say, oh, 10,000. See, this is the man. We just speak it and it happens and all this sort of stuff. No, they haven't read the full testimony. They haven't read the full testimony. He said this because there were times where uh, people would bring things in. George Mueller, he would have a desk and some furniture. And then when things got tight, they had to sell the desk, sell the furniture, and he had nothing. He had one pair of clothes that he stood up in. This doesn't sound like the prosperity, guys, where you're going around in, in um, you know, uh, Chevrolets and, and uh, limousines and $10,000 suits. No, he had none of that. Sometimes he was down to one set of clothes, you know what I mean? They were making clothes for him and things like that. So he had, 
the, the journey was like this of faith, but there was lots of this in between. It wasn't a straight journey where God just said, oh, yeah, maybe we just get you to the end, 10,000 orphans. No, there were times where he desperately, desperately struggled. This were his quotes, and his quotes have given me some great comfort in this last week, which has been a tough one, I'd have to say. I've been, I've been hanging on to God through this whole week. And uh, it says this, this is his words, George Mueller. Do but stand still in the hour of trial and you will see the help of God if you trust him. Stand still in the hour of trial and you will see the help of God if you trust him. Be still and know that I am God. When you've done all you can do and you're into yourself, stand still and know that if you trust him, God will send deliverance. God will send deliverance your way. I want to um, read a little thing that he wrote. It says, freedom for, for anxiety. And it's based in the passage in Philippians that we might read later on. It says, the second passage to which I desire to direct your attention, you will find in the epistle of Philippians, the fourth chapter and in the sixth and seventh verses. Be careful for nothing. Mine says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer. Remember, Peter and John going up at the hour of prayer. If you're not a praying person now, get attention. You haven't got a thirst for God. Remember, the living water requires a thirst and a coming. If you're spending more time looking at the news reports on COVID-19, you need to turn it off and become a praying person uh, to see this. But be, because anxiety comes from watching that thing, but the peace and the power of God comes from prayer. And so he says this, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, don't look around and say, this is what's happened to me. Look what's going on. Say, thank God everybody's in good health. Thank God nobody died this week. Thank God they've been restored to me. Thank God I'm standing here, clothes on my back, a meal tomorrow. Thank God. Don't, don't come and whinge at God. Make your requests known. Be honest. Be blunt with God. But come with thanksgiving as well. And let your requests be known unto God. And the peace of God which passes understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ, uh, Christ Jesus. Be careful for nothing, he says. This by no means signifies that we may be careless, thoughtless, or unconcerned about everything. That is not the meaning of it. The meaning is not to be anxious about anything. This is one of the privileges of the children of God, that they are permitted, and not only permitted, but invited, and not only invited, but commanded to bring all their cares, sorrows, trials, and wants to their heavenly father to roll all their burdens are you feeling burdened down roll the burdens upon God to cast their cares upon him and because they are permitted yea commanded so to do they have no need to be anxious about anything however many or varied our difficulties or necessities we should commit them all in believing prayer to God but we should not be anxious. And why not? Because it is impossible to be anxious without dishonoring God. Trust God. Let go of the vine. Let go of the branch and I'll catch you. If the men of the world see that we Christians are anxious like themselves, they will have ground for saying that our profession of having an almighty friend and helper in heaven is only... Uh, is is only his profession and therefore we dishonor God by not trusting him in the hour of need. This is a man that fed 10,000 orphans every day, believing, never asked for a dollar, never asked for money, this man. This is another quote from George Mueller. Truly we are poorer than ever, but through grace my eyes look not at the empty stores and the empty purse, but to the riches of our Lord only. What a man, what a man. There was a time, one of my favorite stories with uh, George Mueller is where one of the house mothers came and they dressed the children, got them ready for school and brought them down to for breakfast and they said to George, he said, we've got nothing to feed these kids, nothing, nothing. They set the table, George said set the table, so they settled the kids down in their places, they set the tables in front of them 
And George had quiet confidence because he'd seen it many, many times before that God would supply their needs. And so he began to give thanks for the food. And as he's saying grace, the kids are looking at one another and thinking, is this man crazy? There's no food. There's nothing cooking. And after he'd given thanks and said, Amen, there was a knock at the door. And it was the baker. And the baker opened the door and he said, Listen, I couldn't sleep all night. I couldn't sleep all night for some reason. I just knew that you'd need bread in the morning. And so I brought three, ba three loads full here. And he brought the bread in. And as they were rejoicing in the bread that came through, this is 300 kids they got to feed. As they're rejoicing, bringing the bread in, they shut the doors and everyone smiles on their faces. Then there was another knock at the door. And as they knock on the door, the milkman's cart had broken down right outside the orphanage. The wheel had fallen off. So he knocked on the door and he opened up. He said, look, by the time I get someone here to fix the cart, the milk will be off. And so you guys may as well have it. So all the staff went out, grabbed the pails of milk, and all the children ate that day bread and milk. That's the provision of God. That's the living waters. That's the testimonies that comes out of these sort of times. We need living water. Not the cisterns that are broken, that are stagnant, brackish water that's toxic after a while to drink. That's what the world offers. Jesus says, if you live with me, you can live through these things and have a testimony that is amazing, not through every, every need and every hardship going away, but through the crushing pressure, we see the deliverance of God, just as George Mueller said. More than 10,000 children lived in that orphanage. Here, listen to this. This is, this is what he did with 10,000 kids. Every one of these kids had this experience. Listen to this. When each child became old enough to live on his own, okay, George would pray with him and put a Bible in his right hand and a coin in his left. And then he would explain this. Imagine 10,000 kids going out in the world like this with a coin and a Bible. And he explained this. He explained to a young person that if he held on to what was in his right hand in the Bible, if he held on to God, God would always make sure there was something in his left hand. And these are kids that had grown up in an orphanage where they'd seen the deliverance of God time and time again, never missing a meal, faithful, faithful for the 18 years of their life until they're old, or 16 years or when they got a job at 14 or whatever it is, it was different in those days, they would go off and they knew that what he was saying was not, not some theory, not some uh, just a teaching out of the Bible, they'd seen it with their own eyes that this man had faith to believe that God would provide day after day. I want to tell you, God will provide for you day after day after day. That is his promise to you. You will have clothes and you will have food. That's what his promise is. I want you to look and we'll go to um, Luke chapter 12. This is the express will of God, the express will of God. It doesn't sit well with our culture, does it? Luke 12, oops, I'm in John, sorry. Here we go. Luke 12 and verse 22. Let's go to that, 22. It says, they said to his disciples, who said? Jesus said. This, what did he say? In my Bible, it's read because these are the words of Jesus. Listen, he's speaking to you right now. Listen to these words. Therefore, I say to you, you do not worry about your life. Are you worried today? Jesus telling you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat. You worry about next, year's, next week's grocery bills? He's saying, don't worry about your life. Nor about the body. What you will put on. Life in God is more than food and the body more than clothing. He says, now listen, he gives us examples. Consider the ravens. They neither, neither sow nor reap which have neither storehouse or barn. They don't have any provision for tomorrow. And God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you by worrying can add? He understands, listen, he's saying, listen, this is what the world does. They worry about what tomorrow and how we're going to provide for tomorrow and what's going to be on the other side of tomorrow. And he's saying to you, don't worry about your life. He says this, which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? And then, and if you are not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? Can you handle today? 
Don't worry about tomorrow. Let's just worry about today. Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you, Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. And if God so clothes the grass, which is today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. How many times is Jesus saying this? Don't worry about it. Don't be anxious. For all these things the nations of the world seek after. But your Father, if you're abiding in Jesus, if you're under the shadow of his wings, if you're in his mighty tower of refuge and strength, he says this. He says, they seek after it, but your Father has knows that you have need of these things. He's not saying, okay, just sit around, read the Bible and pray. And, you know, uh, uh, no, no, he's saying, listen, I know you need these things. Just as I know that Matthew needs, Matthew's not stressing out one bit about all this. He's out there jumping on the trampoline, playing, knocking things, doing crayons, all this sort of stuff. Is he worried about when the, whether we're going to make the, make the rent or pay the bills or, or buy food? For, he doesn't, listen, that's what God's saying to you. You're my child and he's your father. He knows you have need of these things. He says this, but seek the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added to you. What, houses, lands? No. Food for tomorrow, clothes on your back. That's what he promises. Do not fear, little flock, for it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourselves money bags which do not grow old, a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches nor moth destroys, for where your treasure is is where your heart is also. This is the crux of the matter. God is through these situations is wrenching from our hearts all the things that the West tightly wants to grab onto and is reluctant to leave. But we need to learn the lesson as Christians beforehand that we need to let things go and say, God, my life is in your hands. You will look after me. I trust you, Lord. I trust you, Lord. And so that's his promise to you. That's the red letter. That's what Jesus is saying. Listen, there's an end to all of this. There will be. There will be. I don't know when it is. Uh, some of these droughts went for seven years, some three and a half with no rain, things along those lines. Some of them much shorter. This could be done and dusted tomorrow. Who knows? But I do know there's an end to it because it says this in the Word of God, Psalm 30 verse 5, For his anger endures for a moment, and his favor is for life. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. And if you're going to approach this thing with living water, there should be a joy that comes through it, a peace, a power, and a strength that comes out of these deep recesses within you. The rivers that will flow. There is a river that flows from God above. There is a fountain that's filled with His great love. Come to the waters, there is a vast supply. You will never thirst with God. You'll never thirst with God. You can carry you through every situation. I want to uh, finish here with two scriptures. One of them I want to read to you uh, at the start of the week um, where I hadn't put the guy off yet and I was, I was actually quite tense about it and it wasn't sure and Matthew came up to me with a little thing that he'd done in Sunday school God bless Jazz when she does these things because it's um, God has a way of using them down the line and so there's a, um, there's a scripture here oops I'm going the wrong way gosh Philippians here we go and here we go chapter 4 we all know this scripture but I want to read it anyway because we need the word of God into us. It says, chapter 4, verse 11, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. This is Paul. Doesn't sound like prosperity message to me. I know how to be abased. He knows now how to be going down to nothing. And, he says, I know how to abound. There are times where supply is not in lack. We can see it going further out. We're comfort. Great. He knows both of these things. He says, Everywhere in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. 
You say, if he was a true Christian, he wouldn't suffer need. Well, that doesn't fit what Paul said. Paul said, I suffer need. There were some needs that were not met in that for some time. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What's he saying? I can endure these things because Christ is my sufficiency. Nevertheless, you have done well that you have shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but only you. For in Thessalonica you sent aid once again and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you sweet-smelling aroma and acceptable sacrifice well-pleasing to God. And listen to this, what the response of Paul is. And these are the words that Matthew had written on his thing. A promise of God to fix their hearts. And my God, Philippians 4.19, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. There's a heavenly tie that ties you and Jesus, the Holy Ghost, a ministering angel, and the Father all bound up together, all of us. And he's not going to let his children go without a meal or without clothes. So we need not worry. We take, can't take anything out with us. We came in with nothing. God's looked, forward, looked after us from when we were born right to now. And if you're a Christian, you can look back and you can see the faith testimonies, just like George Mueller, of the times God has delivered us time and time again. You can see it. And today we stand and we look and our needs are met. We eat today, clothes on our back. And should we lose everything tomorrow? It's not a given, he says. But he promises you he'll look after you no matter what happens. And even if the worst happens, you get hit by a car, you get COVID-19 and get, suffer the worst of all possible fates that you die. Mate, Paul said to die is gain. You cannot lose for winning. The very final things that the Bible closes with in the book of Revelation, God's down to his last few words in the canon of Scripture. So he's cramming all important things in here as he finishes off. In there you'll find in, verse, in chapter 22, you don't touch, you don't change the words in this book, otherwise the curses of this book will be added to you. He's putting all the caveats in here, the strong things. And this is what he says. Red letters again, verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. Verse 17. And the spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him who hears say, Come, and let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Today, I want you to reevaluate whether you've got living springs coming out of your life. Because if you don't, you're going to be subject to panic you're going to be subject to fear, the fear of losing stuff, the fear of want, the fear of lack, and they will consume you. But if you're filled with living waters, there'll be peace, there'll be joy, there'll be strength, and those things will carry in every situation in life, no matter how bad life gets. No one can steal from you the springs that are coming from a place of strength within that come out of us. The more the world crushes in, it's like the water just keeps pouring out. Strength, peace, joy that will carry you through every hardship. I'm going to end with that song. I want to wish you all the best. I want to pray. Father, I ask you, Lord, those that are out there that are anxious today, God, those that are out there, God, bring them to a place of trust. God, where they can literally lay down this life and God, embrace the life that you have given all those who have been faithful to you going forward. God, they have been despised in this world. They have been 
some homeless, some without earthly goods, and yet faithful to you. Even to this day, there are those faithful that are residing, sleeping at rough. But God, you are faithful and the best is yet to come. God, take out of our hearts the spirit of fear, the spirit of anxiety. God, take out of our hearts these things, the turmoil, the night terrors, the lack of sleep, and put within us the peace of God that passes the understanding and the confidence that God will provide our needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. God bless you guys. I hope that we can be meeting in a park, in a car park, on a hill, anywhere soon. I really miss the, the, the contact and so uh, I can't wait to put my arms around you, give a big kiss and a hug and uh, everything out to your family. If there are any needs that require prayer, please text them through to Jazz uh, or Lee or my phone or whatever and we'll be sure to shoot it round to pray. Be assured, Amanda, we're still praying for you, Dale, for recovery, but we're so grateful to God that you're home. That was my first prayer. I remember I came up and prayed with you in the hospital. I said, we're going to get you out of this place. And I thank God that he's done that. God bless you guys. Love you heaps, and we'll see you soon. Huru. Okay, guys, this is the song that we did last week. Of course, in my own style, I stuffed it up. But I want to leave you on this note that... Uh, we don't know what tomorrow brings, but we can trust tomorrow because of what he's done yesterday and what he's doing today. And so let's, uh, let's end with this song. We commit our day tomorrow to him, hey? All my dreams, all my hopes, and every plan for tomorrow They're safely enfolded And kept by His grace So I reach out for the prize Of that great eternal morning When I behold my king face to face All my yesterdays, todays And all my tomorrows Yes, I've given to my Jesus And firmly I stand Yesterdays been forgiven today is secure and tomorrow he holds in his hand all my dreams all my hopes and every plan for tomorrow they're safely Enfolded and kept by His grace So I reach out for the prize Of that great eternal morning When I behold my King face to face All my yesterdays Today's and all my tomorrow Yes, I've given to my Jesus And firmly I stand Yesterday's been forgiven Today is secure And tomorrow he holds in his hand All my yesterdays, todays And all my tomorrows Yes, I've given to my Jesus 
and firmly I stand. Yesterday's been forgiven, today is secure, and tomorrow he holds in. And tomorrow he holds in his hand. And tomorrow he holds in his hand. Just remember the hands that hold you hold tomorrow. So be anxious for nothing but everything by prayer and supplication. Make your requests known to the one that looks after you. God bless you until next time.